My full disclosure is that I'm not an MD, I'm a basic scientist, I'm a PhD. Uh, so I work at UCL, at the University College of London Cancer Institute, and my laboratory has two big questions. The first question is, how is the immune response against cancer regulated? Which is a pretty big question. And following that one, linked to that question, is how can we interfere with that regulation in order to promote the most strongest and long-term um, <clears throat> and durable anti-tumor responses? So the model we use, uh, it's a melanoma. Uh, it, we use a mouse, mouse model for melanoma. It's a transplantable cell line called B16 melanoma. And actually, most of the data that I'm going to show today, we are now uh, expanding into lung cancer and renal cancer and seeing pretty similar results. So I think that it's going to be most of the lessons that we're learning from melanoma that we could translate later on into renal cell carcinoma. So one of the biggest challenges is that as tumor progresses and they get bigger, uh, the efficacy of therapies are reduced, are significantly reduced. And one of the obvious uh, reasons for that would be to say, well, there is an increase in the tumor burden, so it's harder for the few immune cells that can recognize cancer to really target that huge amount of cells growing. But really what we're interested in are other things that come up, particularly within the tumor microenvironment. Like one of them, those is the inhibition of T-cell function. And two very important molecules controlling T-cell function are CTLA-4 and PD-1. Um, so I'm going to talk particularly about CTLA-4. Another cellular subset that regulates immunity within the tumor microenvironment and also outside the tumor microenvironment are regulatory T-cells. And also physical barriers such as the vasculature or the immune suppressive tumor microenvironment also can prevent anti-tumor responses. So the two main things that I'm going to talk about are CTLA-4 and regulatory T cells, all focus on our models of cancer in mice. So what is CTLA-4 and why is it so important? Why are we focused on this molecule? In order to get a T cell um, to respond to a stimuli by a tumor cell or by antigen-presenting cell, two signals are required. One signal is the T cell receptor and the other one is a signal through uh, a receptor called CD28. Signal 1 and signal 2 generate a positive signal into the T cell and the T cell gets activated and it goes and it kills the parasite, it kills the tumor cell in theory. The problem is that uh, while that is occurring, in intracellular vesicles, this molecule, CTLA-4, gets accumulated. It gets displaced into the immune synapse, and when it gets there, it has higher affinity for B7-1. So it displaces CD28 away, you lose the positive signal into your T cell, and you gain a negative signal. So it's really like a break on immunity. So you stall any immune response against that tumor antigen. So years ago in the laboratory where I trained as a postdoc, we came up with the hypothesis that an antibody that could bind to CTLA-4 with high affinity will be able perhaps to displace it from the immune synapse, allowing CD28 to regain binding to its receptor and then send a positive signal and re-engage in immunity, reactivate in immunity. <clears throat> so my focus throughout these years has been to understand, well, one, to see if that works, and two, to understand the mechanism by which this will act. So the first thing that I was interested in was to look at what's going on within a tumor of an untreated animal. So we take mice, we challenge them with the, cell, uh, with the tumor cell line, and we wait 15 to 20 days, and then we look by histology and by flow cytometry what's going on. As a, as a reference point, you can see this is quantification in lymph nodes. So in lymph nodes, you have a high proportion of CD8 or killer cells, a, slow proportion, a small proportion of regulatory T cells, which are marked by a transcription factor called FOXP3. These are immunosuppressive T cells. They suppress immunity. And a high proportion of helper cells. Okay? So these guys are going to help these guys to kill the tumor, and these guys are going to prevent the response. So everything comes out into balance at the end of the day. So what is it that we see in a tumor, and a developing tumor? Well, we see a completely different picture. In blue, you see CD8 cells. You see very, very few CD8 cells within a developing tumor. And what you see the most are these green cells with red inside, which is FOXP3. So you see patches of infiltration, and those patches of infiltration are mostly, media, mo mostly um, focused on regulatory T cells. When we quantify that, what you can observe here, it's a pretty much a one-to-one -one proportion of effector to regulatory T cells. And based on our in vitro analysis, we know that when they exist at a one-to-one -one proportion, that's actually, it's a balance that favors suppression instead of immune activation. So it's a, it's a non-viable balance for the immune response against cancer. So the question comes out then, what will happen if we inhibit CTLA-4 signals? Will that be sufficient to tilt this balance towards the effector compartment and get good anti-tumor responses? So the experiment is pretty much the same, but now we add anti-CTLA-4 blocking antibodies that we have generated, plus a cellular vaccine. And again, this is what we observe in the untreated animal. So in red, you have a vasculature marker. In green, CD3, you have T cell infiltration, so very few T cells, lots of vasculature. And in blue, which you don't see any blue there, it's ICAM. 
So ICAM is a, a, a molecule required for extravasation of lymphocytes into the inflammatory site. So basically, this vasculature is pretty much off. It doesn't express any ICAM. Uh, when we look deeper to see those CD3 cells, what are they? You see here in purple, you can see FOXP3, so most of them are regulatory T cells. You don't see any CD8 in red. And when we treat the mice with anti-CTLA-4, the landscape completely changes now. So the vasculature now lights up for ICAM. So there is upregulation of this molecule required for extravasation of lymphocytes. And now there is a huge infiltration of CD3 positive cells in green, which correlates with ICAM expression. When we look at those, again, deeper to see what, CD3s, what, what T cells are those CD3s, we see again that the landscape has changed. And what we see the most are CD8 cells, CD8 killer cells infiltrating the tumor. We still see quite a bit of purple cells, but when we quantify, what we'll observe is this. The untreated group have, again, a very low proportion of effector to regulator cells, but the treated mice with anti-CTLA-4, the proportion of effector to regulators goes up, and that directly correlates with an increase in survival of the mice. So untreated mice, we have zero, survive, uh, zero mice surviving challenge, and treated mice with anti-CTLA-4 and, 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 and cellular vaccines, we get up to 70% of the mice being, being protected. So, so this tilt on the balance of the intratumor balance of effector and regulators does correlate, at least in our hands, to uh, tumor progression or tumor protection. And this works in mice, and interestingly, it also works in humans. So recent phase three, two recent phase three clinical trials now have shown for the first time that, that immunotherapy, at least epilumimab, or anti-human anti CTLA-4, can actually produce um, over, enhance overall survival and produce durable responses in a percentage of patients. So this has been pretty um, encouraging for all of us working on immunotherapy. <clears throat> the issue is that, as you can see here, uh, there is plenty of room for improvement, right? So despite its promise and efficacy, the good responses are still limited to a percentage of the patients. So we're in the business of looking at mechanisms and trying to understand what's going on in terms of uh, mechanistical analysis, but also to try to understand through those mechanisms how can we boost or further the, the responses. So back to the bench. So as I told you, CTLA-4 blocker inhibition of inhibitory signals can mediate rejection of tiny tumors. But the problem is that if we delay therapy to day eight, uh, just, just, day, uh, just a couple days later, we don't see any protection at all. So as I showed you before, CT, uh, regulatory T cells have a correlation with, um, with response. So what if we try to deplete the regulatory T cells? Could we have a, a complete response? So we set up a system where we delay treatment by to day eight instead, instead of day three. And basically what happens in that system is that even though we're treating with GVAX and anti-CTLA-4, none of the mice are protected. So it's the perfect system to test uh, synergy. So the question is, if we deplete regulatory T cells, we can deplete them with an anti antibody against CD25, <clears throat> what will happen? And what happens is that there is also quite a good degree of protection. So the depletion of regulatory T cells does synergize with anti-CTLA-4 to produce good anti-tumor responses. The problem is that this protocol is in no way uh, clinical or clinically applicable because it's before the tumor challenge. So what we wanted to know is that after tumor establishment, if we deplete regulatory T cells, can we get tumor protection? And the answer is no. So there is no protection at all, no synergy. And the prevailing wisdom in the field has been that the anti-CD25 antibody will also deplete effector cells because it does upregulate the CD25 marker or, or receptor upon activation. So we wanted to test this hypothesis. And we quantified the number of effector cells, tumor reactive effector cells, during therapy. So no depletion, there is very few effectors. When we deplete therapeutically, uh, prophylactically, which result in tumor protection, there is a huge number of effector cells. But when we do the therapeutic depletion of T-Rex, now we have an even bigger response. So there is no depletion of the effector cells. So we were not understanding what was going on. Why are we not getting anti-tumor response or tumor rejection if we're getting bigger or stronger protection in the periphery and lymph nodes? So we look inside the tumor, and what we observe is that in this case, we see lots of CD8s infiltrating the tumor, thus the tumor is being rejected. But in this case, although we're enhancing systemic responses, we're not seeing an infiltration. And after looking at different parameters, the only thing that we could see uh, correlating was that in the early depletion, we will see an increase of ICAM and VCAM expression, but not on the late depletion. So this suggested to us that there is, a, upon established tumors, there is a dissociation between systemic and local responses. So what we're measuring in the blood or in lymph node does not directly correlate to what we're observing within the tumor. And the vasculature seems to be a limiting step. <clears throat> 
or a limiting point. So one of the ways to bypass this that we attempted was to <clears throat> generate the same type of immune response, purify T cells from these guys that, that where the vasculature is desensitized, it's not upregulated ICAM and VCAM, and then transferring those cells into a mouse with the same, time, uh, same, same size tumor, but has been conditioned with total body radiation, which has been shown to upregulate ICAM and VCAM. And what we observe in that case <clears throat> is that only on the triple combination, we observe hyperregulation of VCAM and ICAM within the tumor vasculature, which correlates now with huge infiltration of CD8 cells surrounding the vasculature. And now, compared to the control groups uh, that none of the mouse survives, we have up to 70 and 80 percent protection. So a combination strategy where radiation, when we have radiation-induced tumor destruction and CTLA-4-induced immune activation can produce a, a significant responses against melanoma against established melanoma. And we see very similar stuff, uh, data with uh, cyclophosphamide. So <clears throat> that's basically to summarize that we can move from left to right, but we have to target uh, pathways that come, pa resistant pathways that will come systematically. How this could be applicable therapeutically, and again, I'm just a PhD, so this is just a suggestion, it's something that we're trying to put in the clinic, or at least suggest to our collaborators, is that whatever is your favorite therapy, uh, you can have some level of response. The problem is that you have many patients that don't show any clinical response, and those are put back into radio and chemotherapy. So what we think it could be possible is through immune monitoring, identify those patients that have this dissociation between local and systemic responses. Those that are having a response, a good systemic immune response, but not responding clinically. Take those cells, freeze them out, put your patient back into your chemo radio as scheduled, and then freeze them back. So this will, be, this will represent pretty much what we're doing on the animals. Feasible or not feasible, I don't know, but it, it's something that we're really thinking about. Um, so the problem with the combination with chemo and radio is that the timing is always detrimental for immunology, for the immune system. So if you use at the same time chemo or radiotherapy with immune activation, you will destroy your immune response. So that's the perfect scenario that we think that the combination of immune therapeutics and targeted therapeutics, and I think James will talk a little bit more about that, but basically they are completely complementary, uh, where immune therapeutics uh, lack, which is for example, they can't fight very well against advanced disease, targeted therapeutics can add, add that on by producing very good destruction and fast destruction of the tumor antigens. And where targeted therapeutics might lose uh, response because of resistant variants or, or loss of long-term responses, the immune system can kick in by uh, the capacity to generate epitope spreading or immunological memory. Um, so I don't want to expand anymore. So those are the things that we want to do in the future in the laboratory. Uh, the, I think that the take-home message is that we have, there are three phases that need to be targeted in order to get good immunotherapeutic uh, immunotherapy against cancer. One is to understand what happens in the periphery, what regulates immunity in the periphery. But we cannot leave out of sight what's going on with the vasculature. If we don't make the vasculature permeable for our activated T cells, they're not going to go inside the tumor, they're not going to reject the tumor. And the other critical question is, what establishes the, intracellular, the intratumoral balance between effector and regulatory T cells? And that's very much what I want to show you. This is where all the work is done at the UCL Cancer Institute. <clears throat>